Uh, welcome to Bioethics Grand Rounds. I'm Christian Berkler, uh, along with Andy Schumann. I'm the co-chief of the Clinical Ethics Service of the CBSSM, which puts on bio, which brings you Bioethics Grand Rounds. So we're lucky today to have one of our core members of the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine, Naomi Laventhal, um, who's uh, been a friend of mine since I joined this institution in 2012. Um, Naomi went to, uh, she grew up in, in uh, New Orleans and went to Indiana University for her undergrad where she studied anthropology. She then went back to New Orleans for medical school at, and uh, got her MD from LSU. She then moved back to the Midwest and spent some of formative years of her life at the University of Chicago where she did her pediatrics training, her neonatology training, and um, was really mentored by Lainey Friedman Ross, who was a, a kind of a pioneer in, in pediatric um, bioethics at the McLean Center for Ethics at the University of Chicago, where she uh, did a clinical ethics fellowship, as well as got a master's degree in public uh, policy studies. So um, she has quite an area, a wealth of expertise that she brings to the subject she's going to talk to us about. And so I hope you welcome uh, Naomi. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Nice to see a nice big neonatology cohort there in the middle outside of their natural habitat. Um, can everybody hear me okay? We sound good? All right, um, let's go. Uh, I have designed this to, I hope to have about 10 minutes for questions at the end. I'll try not to go over so we can do that. Um, and I talk about this topic enough that I have come to kind of anticipate what those questions are and have tried to build some of those things into the talk as we go. Um, so I have no financial disclosures. The disclosure I do have is sort of funny and I know it's a weird thing to start with pictures of yourself in your opening slide. But the reason I've done that is to do two things. One is to acknowledge up front that what I do is really enabled by parents who are willing to talk to me and share their stories and give me photos. And they, these pictures of, of I'll use of real patients today are all done with their permission. Some parents want me to t talk about their kids and use their names. Some would rather I didn't do that and so I'll do that accordingly. But my work has been really affected by these, by these children and these experiences. So I wanted to lead with that. I also got the advice once to start with your acknowledgments rather than saving those for the very end. And I do have a kind of bigger orienting slide to the neonatal ethics lab and the projects we're working on and what we're doing. But there are a few people at the front end I really wanted to acknowledge. Um, there are a lot of people working with us in a, on a lot of different projects, but Stephanie Kakora, Phoebe Danziger, and Christy Lawrence are the current core of the neonatal ethics lab over in Mutt. And I'm really fortunate to work with them. Um, I get to work with a lot of different divisions with pediatrics, within OB, and with CBSSM, of course. And that's also a really um, enriching experiment, experience that allows me to do the work that I do. Um, my other University of Chicago guru is Bill Meadow, who taught me everything I know about neonatology and neonatal ethics. And it's really because of the way he brought me up in that world in Chicago that I um, have come to think about things the way I do. Um, and then Sam McCauley is the brain of the outpatient uh, consult clinic without whom I couldn't keep track of anything or study these patients or do anything really. And so I wanted to acknowledge her at the front end as well. All right, so neonatal ethics are kind of polarizing and interesting and I would argue here to stay. Pregnancies are going to be too short and they're going to be complicated and as hard as we work to stop some of those complications from happening, they're going to continue and babies are gonna be born too early and they're gonna be born sick. And those are going to, the issues that the care of these infants raise are gonna to continue to be interesting to, I think, people outside of neonatology. People want, seem to wanna to talk about this at cocktail parties and at the water cooler and people have opinions and those opinions rapidly become polarizing is what I've found. And I'm hoping that today we depolarize some of that and talk about this with more cool heads, but cooler heads don't always prevail when it comes to neonatal ethics. Um, the other thing is that neonates are not only cared for by neonatologists, they're cared by, for by a lot of people, both in the NICU and when they leave our NICU and go out into the world. And so I'm hoping that this is of broad interest, even if you're not a neonatologist. So um, one of the wonderful things about working with students is that you learn like what the kids are saying. <laughs> and um, this too long didn't read thing is something that kind of speaks to me. So I'm actually front loading my take home points. Um, so that if you have to go or this isn't really your jam, you can sort of hopefully ruminate on these things as you leave. And I will um, cover all of this in various degrees of granularity in the next 45 minutes. But one of the things that's become really central to the work that I do is to start with the assumption that we're all well-intended. And we might disagree with how to get to the right answer. But if we don't start with that assumption, again, that polarization is where we land. Um, another really important take home is that reasonable people disagree about what a good outcome looks like. And a lot of our debates, I think, come to 
difficulty reconciling what someone else thinks is a good outcome. Good ethics start with good facts. I was brought up in a school of ethics and epidemiology being inherently interrelated, and I'll give you a lot of facts today in the hopes that it informs your ethics. In general, when people say, how do you do this? It seems really hard. The NICU is really hard. The ethics are really hard. I say, you take a deep breath and you tell the truth, but you be nice. One of the things we hear again and again, again and again in the NICU is that people are tired of the bad news bet and that they want to be told things in a more gentle and hopeful way. And although generally I think there is no average parent and there is no average narrative, I don't think any parent would ever say, I want you to be mean to me. And that seems really obvious, but I think sometimes we think that tough love is the way to go, and I think it's rarely. The other thing is that for all of the hand-wringing we do in all aspects of ethics, in all difficult neonatology cases, one way or the other, these situations end. They don't always end happily, but I think this sense sometimes that we're stuck and that it's just never going to get better is really not true. So just for folks who are not oriented to the NICU and don't know what we do there, I wanted to spend a minute talking about that. Um, this is a, an actual picture of our, one of our rooms right before we moved in. They're really nice. They're all single bed. We have 46 beds in our main unit, and then we recently added six more step-down beds up on the 10th floor. There are 13 neonatologists currently um, who divide the care of those babies, and we also share those units with the, our pediatric surgery colleagues, so we are not actually primary service on every single baby in the NICU. Um, we have a four-bed uh, resuscitation area up on 9 in Mont Voigtlander where Every bed can function at the full level of a NICU bed, including bedside surgery and ECMO cannulation and all of those things. A lot of kids tour through that unit and never actually come downstairs. In our NICU, we offer a full scope of pediatric surgical services and pediatric subspecialty consultation. We offer ECMO. We offer therapeutic hypothermia or whole body cooling, as we call it. Um, we are, do have some limitation in what transplants we offer, but transplant within the NICU is a, it almost never happens. It's just as if you're thinking about what do we have here and what do we not have, there's very little that we don't have. Um, we also have a very broad and complex OB service. I can't do it justice today, but certainly I've been awed by the scope of the work that they're taking on and the breadth of fetal procedures that they're offering. And that's increasingly part of the work that we're all doing together. So what do neonatologists do? We take care of babies. It's fun. It's what, it's, it's what we're all there for. We do lots of procedures. We go to deliveries. Not every delivery that we go to comes to the NICU, but we attend a lot of them. We go on transport, which is super cool and fun when you get to do it. Um, for most people, some people really hate it, but um, we have a plane, we have a helicopter, so it's, it, it is in that sort of like fast-paced, intense ICU mode, which is what most people come to neonatology for. However, there's some other stuff that we do that might seem a little less jazzy, but is really my area of interest. My big area of interest, and most of what I'll talk about today, is prenatal consultation. Why we do that, how we do it, what we know about doing it better or worse. And then delivery coordination. A lot of this is less about ethics, so I won't get into a lot of it today, but just the procedural aspects of planning complex deliveries is a big part of our work. Lots of people do prenatal consults, and this certainly isn't exhaustive. And OB is not on this list because I think they are the prenatal service. I, I put them aside. But lots of pediatric care providers see pregnant women before they deliver for a whole host of reasons. My experience is obviously doing that as a neonatologist, but we work with these folks all the time. So what do we do when we see women who are pregnant? A lot of what we do is the, is the sort of core of pediatric work, which is anticipatory guidance. Most of what I do in my consults is taking out a diagram and drawing the nest and saying, this is what it looks like, and this is where your baby's going to be, and this is where you're going to stand. When will I be able to see my baby? Will I still be able to breastfeed the sort of prematurely, I think, dashed hopes of breastfeeding is a lot of the where I start with women when I see them in consultation. How long will my baby be in the NICU is a common question we get at the very front. We also do some predicting. We help people anticipate whether their baby will live or die, what kind of interventions they'll need in the ICU and beyond, and what their baby's life will be like. That last one is the hardest. We can make some predictions about what the outcomes look like on paper, but what it will be like is very hard to predict and plan for people. We also get asked to participate in the care of pregnant women quite a bit when they're still making decisions about what they're going to do. And we try to help them make those decisions, mostly by eliciting their values and providing them with information. We do see some women who are still considering pregnancy termination for a whole host of complex reasons. We see women who are debating whether or not they want to get invasive testing and, or genetic testing and thinking about whether or not that's what they want to do and how that information will help them. We help plan for fetal interventions, particularly if those are happening at a point where the baby is gestationally viable. So there might be some decisions to make about what happens if the procedure doesn't go well. 
Sometimes we are in full palliative care mode, helping people plan for a stillbirth or for a comfort care plan after birth. And then we distinguish between a trial, trial of therapy, which I would argue is a little more restrained than a full uh, request for everything. And we, we try really hard not to ever say that we'll do everything. We say we'll do everything that we think will help. But some people are more interested in, a, in confirmation that it's as bad as we thought or a tribe with a sense that there would be interventions that would be outside of what they wanted. So we do that whole host of thing. And we've been really interested in how to do this well and who's doing it and how are we teaching people how to do it. So one of the people I'll talk about a lot today is Phoebe Danziger. She's a graduating pediatric resident who's gonna be one of our fellows next year. And she and I surveyed uh, residency and fellowship training programs in of pediatric providers that we thought might need this skill set, and asked them about their experience with trainees and antenatal consultation. Everybody said, yes, this is in our wheelhouse. It's important. We think we ought to be doing it. Um, all of them thought that it could be potentially helpful to pregnant women. And about half said that they weren't seeing enough of these patients saying, I think we could do more than we are. However, more than half of them said they have no curriculum whatsoever to teach people how to do this. And very few of them think that their fellows graduate competent with this skill set. So that's where we're starting. We have a lot of work to do. So let's do some of that work now. So you can't talk about neonatal ethics without talking about preemies. And I'm going to try to do a little bit of this, this now. Um, so this is a real patient that I took care of. His mother allowed me to use his photos and asked me not to use her baby's name. He was very small and very sick when he came to us and he had a very tumultuous ICU course. And this is him now. And this is why we're here, right? I mean, it's one of the reasons why we're here. Everybody wants to see the smiling kid in sunglasses. And this in a lot of ways is a success story that I take a lot of pride in. The story's not entirely happy though. He had a sister and his sister did not survive her ICU stay. She died after about 30 days in the ICU. And clearly she remains a really active part of her family and her brother's life. So this is his one year photo shoot with her in the, in the framed photo there. And I have these photos up here to one say, this isn't just a happy story and we're not there just for the happy stories. And for me, it's just as important how we took care of his sister and how that experience was for them. And the other thing I wanna say about this that I'll say a few times today is that in talking to his mother about this, and I told her I was gonna use these slides for this talk and she asked me what the talk was about. And I said, one of the things that I talk about a lot is whether trying and failing is worth it. And whether those 30 days in the ICU were worth something. And you know, her response to me was this paragraph about Ye Long that said, of course it was worth it. I had 30 days, I would never give those back. And so not everybody has that experience and it's very hard to capture the people who don't because they don't send me photos, but it, um, this is good framing for me in terms of what it's like to take care of the sickest preemie. So the CDC, uh, the, yeah, the CDC reports out preemie statistics. They're harder to get than they used to be. So these are a little old, but they report out the proportion of babies that are born prematurely. And what you'll see, they're the blue bars here of births, proportion of live births. There are very few young preemies. To get below, to get more granular than less than 32 weeks, the bins get like invisibly small but they do represent a lot of infant deaths. In absolute numbers, congenital, um, congenital anomalies is the most common cause of infant death in the United States because there are so many more of them. But proportionally, a lot of the infant deaths are among preemies. So this is why it's an important population to talk about. And there are a lot of surveys that look at what would you do and what should we do. There's a recent really big study that looked at what proportion of infants at the earliest gestational ages are actually being resuscitated. Um, and it, I think this is really interesting and informative about where we are. So what you see here on the right of the, on, on my left, on your right, is 25 and 26 weekers. And what I want to point out is that almost everybody is resuscitating all of those kids. There's just not a lot of variability in resuscitation at 25 and 26 weeks. And again, this is an intent. This is practice. Now, when you look at 22, 23, and 24 weeks, what you see is a very steep gradient and a lot of variability. Right within centers, between centers, people are less uniform about what they're doing. And their behaviors are not even consistent within that week. So even though good gestational dating can be off by a week in either direction, we actually don't just care if you're 23 weeks, we care if you're 23 in one day or 23 in six days. So people put a lot of stock in that dating, whether or not it's reliable. Um, and as gestational age increases, you again, you lose variability in what folks are doing. And this is incredibly important because this same study looked at predictors of survival at these earliest gestational ages. And the single biggest predictor of surviving at 22 weeks was being born in a place where 22 weekers are resuscitated. So 
when we use outcome statistics to counsel parents about what happens to extremely preterm babies, we need to know what we're doing, and we need to know how our own outcomes are influenced by practice in our center. I'll tell you here that we don't use our institutional data to counsel at the margin of viability because we just don't have enough of those babies to think that that's a good idea. But it's really important to understand that non-resuscitated 22 and 23 weekers die. And so then reporting that they all die gets to be very problematic very quickly. Uh, these figures, I'm gonna show you a series of them, parse out all infants and resuscitated infants. You'll see that by the time you're at 25 or 26 weeks, there's not a lot of difference in, in them. And that's, there's two things that happen. One is that the older you are, the more likely you are to survive regardless of how much intervention you get. And the other is the older you are, the more likely you just are to be resuscitated. Um, so at 22 weeks, there are a lot of babies who are born alive but not resuscitated. And it is still true, no matter how you slice it, that survival is a function of gestation. So older babies are more likely to live. It's also still true that survival without severe or moderate impairment is also a function of, a function of gestational age. So older babies are more likely to get out of the NICU without significant neurologic morbidity. That is still true. But one of the big things that happened right as I was finishing my fellowship was a very important study came out pointing out that being a girl in, versus being a boy, weighing 100 gram increments more than a baseline, being a singleton rather than a twin or a multiple, and having a mother who received prenatal steroids before you were born, favorably impacts prognosis as much as being a week older. So at the same gestational age, a girl is like a week riper than a boy. This is really hard to deal with, but really confounds the, um, the way we use gestational age to counsel. And just to spell this out a little bit, the folks who did this study created this jazzy online calculator where if you happen to know all of these things before birth, accepting some imprecision like fetal weight, estimated fetal weight can be off by 100 grams. Um, if you put in what you know, you can get some more specific epidemiologic summary data about the likelihood of survival or not. Um, within those variables. And so what I did here is I played around with it and I held the gestational age fixed and played around with the weight and the sex and whether or not there were twins and whether or not the mom got steroids to make the point that I can make these outcomes look really different all for a 24 weeker. So flat out counseling about just gestational age is problematic. The other thing I wanna point out is that here I'm reporting survival and survival without profound impairment. But you could do that the other way. And this is, there's this phenomenon that we call message framing. Um, which has been really nicely laid out in the study of prenatal counseling for prematurity, which is that when we talk about survival, people are more likely to resuscitate than giving the same data but talking about death. So 70% survival makes people more likely to resuscitate, and saying 30% of infants die makes them less likely to resuscitate, and they're the same data. We've done some research looking at how neonatologists use things like the calculator to do their counseling and what they think the role of that is. What we found is that almost everybody does this. This calculator, there aren't a lot of things that are quite as powerful as the calculator. Some institutions have their own tools for doing this, but almost everybody says they use something like this to do their counseling and that it's really impactful on what they tell people. Almost everybody says, I give the parents the numbers. And what's interesting is the PI of the study of that, of the, of the New England Journal study, when you talk about this in meetings, always said, I never intended for anyone to give people these numbers. But they do, even though they're not sure that the parents want them and that they're not sure that the parents find them helpful, but they keep doing it. Um, and they often say that they're wrong about when they get the numbers, they're not what they thought they were gonna be. And when they're wrong, they were usually, the, the neonatologist was usually overestimating the likelihood of a bad so I think how we use and understanding these numbers is really important. Another really important thing about understanding numbers, I'm gonna spell out over a series of uh, additions to this figure. So again, what I already told you, survival of resuscitated infants from NICU discharge depends heavily on gestational. That's true, it's still true. Intact survival, which means survival without moderate or severe neurologic impairment, is also a function of gestational age, but at a slightly, uh, less steep incline, so, so the survival statistics are more striking by gestation than the chance of surviving without a bad outcome. And all of this assumes that, that you lump together survival and disability. But if you look at intact survival among only the kids who get out of the NICU, so you remove the children who died during a trial of therapy in the NICU, 
the figures start to look a lot, a lot different. And I think what becomes clear is that it really depends on what parents value, what outcome statistics you are to report. The best way to summarize this is what Bill Meadow himself said about it. And he says it better than I've ever managed to do. So I'm just gonna read it to you. Um, he says, moral calculations of the value of neonatal resuscitation depend strongly on the valence assigned to two different types of dying in the NICU. If dying without resuscitation and dying after failed resuscitation are equivalent, then good outcomes very strongly as a function of gestation rate. If, however, dying after resuscitative efforts is better than dying without such effort, that is, if giving our child a chance matters to parents, and if the worst outcome is not death but impaired survival, then the likelihood of a good outcome does not depend on the gestational age. This is probably the hardest and most complicated thing I talk about with parents when I talk about it. Folks who pick on me about this, and there are a lot of them, um, say, yeah, yeah, but that's just the discharge from the NICU. What happens after they leave? That's harder to capture for any number of epidemiologic reason, reasons, but the data that we have are more complicated than you'd think. We know that neonatologists and other neonatal care providers overcall the likelihood of a bad outcome, and that when our epidemiologic assumptions are corrected, we are more optimistic. But it's very hard to correct those assumptions. You can get people part of the way to the truth, but not all the way. Um, and we also know a lot about surviving preemies, mostly in part due to this large cohort in Ontario that um, Saroj Saigal followed for, I think they're in their 40s or 50s now, and she's still following this cohort of ELBW children and a, a controlled match of non-ELBW babies. It is absolutely true that the survivors in her cohort have more morbidities. It's not that they aren't ill. They have more morbidities, they have more neurosensory impairment. They just don't rate their quality of life that much worse than their healthy peers. And that's been called the disability paradox. There's been a lot of writing about this. It's a really interesting phenomenon, but for a lot of us, it really changed the way we think about survival of impairment after the NICU. There, it's not a perfect story though. So a couple of things I wanna say about that. First of all, everybody's self-reported health-related health quality of life goes down as they age pretty quickly. And so that's good for me, it's kind of depressing to look at this. Um, but the other thing is that for the kids who don't have severe neurosensory impairment, they don't feel that much worse off than their healthy partner. Those with the, their healthy, uh, counterparts. Those with neurosensory impairment do report a slightly lower, well, significantly lower quality of life than, than those who don't. But it's really interesting to read about this co cohort and think about how these own, these children survivors report their lives after they leave the NICU. The book Premium Voices is a collection of essays that they wrote that's really compelling if you haven't, if you have a chance to read it. All right, so I promised you this was about ethics, it's bioethics grand rounds. So let's do a couple of things about ethics. Um, the first thing we ought to do is talk about justice, right? Everybody wants to know about money. Isn't it so expensive to take care of preemies? And the answer is that it's not really. It's not the, that individual hospitalizations for the youngest preemies aren't very expensive. They are. They're very long. The driver of inpatient care is ICU bed days. Our patients have 100 or more of them. That's an expensive bill at the end of this. But what's been shown in a number of different ways is that we spend most of our dollars on survivors. And there are so few of these patients to begin with and the survivors and there are so many more of our dollars are spent on kids who get out that when we, you compare us to cohorts of older ICU patients, adults in the ICUs, way more adult dollars are spent on patients who die in the hospital and there are orders of magnitude more of them. So it's really hard to make an argument that a reason not to initiate a trial therapy is because the ICU stay will be so expensive. So let's talk a little bit about best interest. My world about, I think I now have to make this slide more complicated after some really interesting and nuanced talks that I've been to about Charlie Gard. But for today, we're gonna to use a kind of basic set of assumptions here. One is that my patients are not in a position to articulate their preferences. They, I don't know what they would have wanted. And generally we give parents a lot of room to decide what's right for their children. And we care a lot about what they think. However, what they think is limited, how much we can respect what they want and think is limited a little bit by what we call the best interest standard, which is that parents have, physicians have some obligation to act in the best interest of the baby, even if that's not, that's not the preference that the parents are articulating. This is the life of pediatric ethics consultation. So what this means is at the polls, when the prognosis is really bad or really good, we don't offer parents a lot of leeway. We don't offer interventions that are never gonna work and we don't let parents refuse interventions that are almost certain to work. But when there's a lot of prognostic uncertainty, we give parents a lot of room to decide what they think is the right thing. I'm gonna spell that out in terms of prematurity. So 
All right, here's some ethics words. So the way I interpret beneficence for the care of um, extreme preemies is that if a good outcome is considered reasonably likely, we ought to do things to ensure that good outcome. Generally, I think there's consensus that any, any baby born at 25 weeks or later, on the whole, has a good enough chance of responding to resuscitation that it is unequivocally good to resuscitate. Barring comorbidities that we won't get into today. On the other hand, intensivists are not in the business of futile flogging when there's no chance of it working. If there's no chance that it's going to work, intensive care is probably the wrong thing to do. It's probably harmful. And generally, we say anyone born before 22 weeks falls into this category. There simply are no survivors. So initiating intensive care imparts the risk of pain and suffering without any chance of survival. Then there's this squishy gray where a good outcome is unlikely, but it's hard to predict how unlikely it is. And in that situation, we give parents a lot of choices. And historically, that's been 23 weeks. We've said at 23 weeks, it is up to the parents. That was on my neonatology board. At 23 weeks, it is up to the parents what they want to do. I think the things that we're still working out at this institution and around the world are, where do 22-weekers go? When I started my training, 22-weekers fell into the non-maleficence category. They fell into the category of, we don't do this. I think that that's changing. I think we're going to see that change in the next couple of years. There are some survivors. And so we're still sorting this out. But I think to say nobody is resuscitating 22-weekers is just incorrect. Similarly, at the beginning of my training, 24 weeks was still considered to be an optional gestational age for resuscitation. And I think we're going to see that go the other way. Out outcomes for healthy, well-grown 24-weekers are pretty good. And I think we're really struggling with whether or not it's ethically permissible to withhold resuscitation of a good-looking 24 weeks. So this is the lay of the land. So we get called to see these women generally. So we're a 24-hour day operation. Women don't usually time their, their preterm rupture of membranes when they're at home. It happens at weird times of day. They come in. It's usually pretty urgent. It's usually pretty, pretty unexpected. The stakes around this are high. And it's really hard to do it. The timing is tough. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. They've got to get all their labs. They finally have a chance to sleep. And then you get the call saying, can you come see this woman? It, it's really hard to get this right. Um, but on the other hand, she's contracting. You better come see this woman. It's, it's very hard to sort that out. This is stressful for people. They feel yucky about doing it. They don't want to talk about stuff that's hard. And we know that imparting information is really hard. A lot of the great work that's been done through C from CBSSM and its predecessors over the years has been addressing how hard it is for people to understand statistics and numbers. And we know that neonatologists do a lot of hand-wringing about this. They feel mm -hmm. like they should be engaged. They don't know how much they don't know how to talk about spirituality and values and things that are hard. They don't gauge their own participation in, their, in this well. They don't gauge what people want from them very well. It's a really tough nut to crack. But we have some ideas. Again, a lot of work's been done here about the benefit of decision aids and visual representation of statistical outcomes. This is really nice decision aid that was made with pictograms for decision making at the margin of viability. And we were lucky enough to get to participate in a randomized control trial of this of this intervention. The analyses of that are still being done, so I don't have the full results of this, but we randomized a number of babies into this cohort. Um, and what we found is kind of what you'd predict, but it's nice to see it written down. One is that people commented when they felt like they got too much or too little information and commented on balancing the need for facts and considering their own values. And what we found is people are all different. There's not a single average parent. Uh, we also found that people, they want to know what their options are. They want to trust you, and they want to feel supported by you. This is really important. They don't want to be given the printed off table from the Tyson calculator and said, here, good luck with this, which is what sometimes happens. Um, and they want us to be nice. And this seems so obvious, but they're writing it down, which makes me think that at least some of them don't think that we're very empathetic when we, when we see them. They want us to be hopeful, and they want us to be aware of the context. I'm having a contraction. Maybe you could come back in a few minutes, that kind of thing. So just to harp on this issue, there's a lot of data that parents really look for hope and optimism from neonatologists, even if the news is bad. Then they say, I know that the news is bad. You don't have to tell me that the news is bad. I want you to be hopeful with me. When they're up against a wall and there's no time, they're going to pick resuscitation. And one of the most compelling studies reveals that parents say, parents who felt like they had no control over the decision that was made have poor like, long-term psychological outcomes. But the ones who have the worst outcomes are the ones who felt like they made the decision alone. And I think this really points to the large and difficult ban of shared decision making is where we have to live for this. The other thing that I alluded to right when I started is that I think we really have to think about what a good outcome is. And all of our research 
exalts unimpaired survival as the only good outcome. And if that's true for a lot of these patients, the chance of a, chance of a good outcome is vanishingly small. But if we think that dying trying is worth it, or we think that survival with some degree of impairment is worth it, or we think not having tried is the worst thing that we can think of, then the chance of a good outcome changes. And I think if you don't tease this out with people at the front end, it's not gonna go well, and you're gonna get some of the more negative comments that we got in our study. So a lot of work is being done about this, trying to figure out how do we teach our trainees what we call relational competence? How do we develop this skill as a counselor? And people are working on tools. So this paper has a nice uh, checklist with what they call imp controlled improvisation. So the checklist isn't you must do all this, it's to orient you, it's to kind of remind you to where to start. What's your baby's name, right? Some basic things that you can do to establish a, that this baby for a lot of people is already part of their family born or not. And, and to remind yourself to work through this in a methodical way, do the things that you need to do, but also give yourself room to give people what they need. All right, I'm gonna wrap up prenase um, with a few summaries and then move on to non-prematurity related things that we talk about. So. The margin of viability, I still think, is 23 weeks plus or minus one. No one's going to get to a firm number. We are working on revising our guidelines. Currently, I wrote them in 2011, and they offered a little bit of room to resuscitate the occasional 22-weeker that was better than expected. I imagine we're going to move a little, a little bit towards more liberal resuscitation of 22-weekers, but that's still something that we're working on. Marginally viable infants don't affect the bottom line that much. There aren't very many of them. There aren't a lot of resources spent on survivors. We call this on, spent on babies who die in the ICU. We call this an early declaration of mortality, which will come up again today. Gestational age isn't everything. It's fascinating to talk about, but there are other features that impart the prognosis just as much, and some of them are harder to deal with. Like your baby's a resuscitation for can, a candidate for resuscitation because she's a girl. But if it's a boy, it would be so much worse that we wouldn't. That's a tough thing to deal with with families. And we're really struggling with how to use some of the epidemiologic data that just seem too morally loaded to write guidelines around. Among survivors, rates of adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes are similar to gestationally older infants for whom resuscitation is considered morally obligatory. Among survivors, it's not really all about gestational age. That's a hard thing to deal with. And definitions of acceptable and unacceptable outcomes are preference sensitive. There is no single good story or good outcome. And the counseling is really important. We need to get better at it. We need to get better at it in a whole number of ways. But I think we're starting to get some ideas on how to do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So these issues don't apply to preemies. Most of the study about, studies about prenatal counseling are about preemies. But that's, especially at a referral hospital like this, that's not all that we do. So in comes the world of outpatient consults, which has been in evolution since I've been here, but we've got it down to a reasonably, reasonably good equilibrium. We are now available basically four and a half days a week to offer outpatient consults, mostly in the fetal diagnostic center. We do have a separate clinic for women who, um, who have substance use disorders, particularly narcotics, and do some anticipatory guidance with them about likely outcomes of children born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. There are several steps to do this. One is you have to talk to your OB colleagues. I think it's never a good idea to walk into these rooms cold without having established some framework or some groundwork with them. We look at the ultrasounds. We might talk to other specialists. We might include other specialists. And we write what we call patient care coordination notes, which should give some tips to the delivery teams on what to do when the baby's born. And one plug I want to make is that we have this really great conference every week uh, over in Mott called Fetal Management Conference, where Neonatology and OB and pediatric cardiology and pediatric surgery and, and a host of other people, the sonographers come and we talk about the new abnormal ultrasounds and the new tough cases. I think it's one of the better conferences that we have and I've learned, I've gone from just thinking ultrasounds with like this black and white grainy stuff to actually being able to look at them and know what I'm seeing. Um, so it's a really great conference. And we see all kinds of stuff. We certainly see fetal anomalies and genetic disorders. We see, uh, we do some counseling around fetal procedures and fetal surgery. We don't do those procedures, but we participate in some of the decision-making. Some maternal conditions. This is a referral center for pregnant women as well. So some of these women are really sick and have some really hard decisions to make regarding their own health and balancing that with the outcome of their baby. Um, we, do, we do a fair bit of work in uh, RH and platelet incompatibilities that result in really serious illnesses, usually in more term babies. Um, threats of prematurity, complex twin pregnancies that I'll talk about, complex delivery planning. Some of this involves the kind of 20 minute race to the cath lab thing that we sometimes work on, but really advanced multi, multidisciplinary counseling. Um, some palliative care and comfort care planning. 
And so this is a figure I made with circle letter. If anyone can find me a box to fill in this hole and to figure out what to put there so I don't have this weirdly asymmetric slide, I will buy you a drink. Um, but we've worked really hard on this outpatient model and thinking about where are the steps that we can intervene. A lot of these women don't start at this center. A lot of them begin with their, um, with their obstetric care out in the community. Michigan's a, uh, Michigan's a big state. There aren't a lot of high-risk OBs. They get referred here, and this is an issue because sometimes they don't have a lot of time to make some of these decisions by the time that they come. But we do more ultrasounds, get more testing, arrange some consultations. Sometimes there's a fetal treatment that happens. We learn a little more. We do some more consultations. We make a plan, and then something happens, and it all goes horribly wrong, and we have to regroup and do it again. Um, and then the baby's born, and we offer postnatal care. And that's a lot of steps to coordinate and get right. So I want to talk about genetic testing a little bit because this, I think people go awry with this a lot. And the way they go awry with it is this. Why would you have a genetic test if you weren't going to have a pregnancy term? I think that that argument is so counterproductive to good neonatology planning, to good perinatal care planning. There are lots of good reasons to genetic test, even if pregnancy termination is not something that's ever going to be on the table for that patient. One is to make plans. Where are you going to have your baby? Where are you going to deliver? What, who needs to be there? What do we need to, need to do to keep your baby safe? Um, what workup needs to be done right after birth? Um, and what are we going to do once your baby's born? I think we have the we there's a lot of missed opportunity in not having this information. And some families really will decide that that information isn't helpful to them. But the false dichotomy, I think, is really dangerous and important that we deal with going forward. Another false dichotomy is any baby with anything has to come to the NICU. And one of the things that we've been working on really hard is to allow women to have a normal birth experience as much as we can. Um, what a normal birth experience is going to vary. Some things we can't, we can't do. You know, when someone says, you know, is found to have uh, transposition and says, does this interfere with my plan for home birth? Yes, it does. You know, so we can't always do everything that people want, but we can allow women to have some bonding time with their babies. And we've done that in cardiology really nicely. We have standardized wording so that everyone agrees about which kids can stay with their moms for a few hours. Uh, uh, ductuses don't slam shut. You have a little time to figure this out. Um, one of the questions that's operationally important is does the baby need to be delivered in the OR for proximity to our resuscitation area? That delays scheduled C-sections. It has all these downstream problems. Can we let this baby deliver in the room? Um, how much of this workup can be done from the room? How, can much can, how much of it can be done on cord blood where we don't have to poke the baby for labs? So a lot of the work that we have is actually trying to de-escalate rather than escalate illness. And then we do some really jazzy stuff. So we are becoming, we have become a place that does fetal surgery for, um, in utero fetal surgery for myeloma and seal. These pictures are called Hand of Hope, which I have some concerns about. But, but, um, but um, the reason you deliver the arm first is usually to do some kind of anesthesia before you deliver the baby's backside to do the repair. We're well into the double digit number of cases that we've done here with this. And neonatology is part of a two-day coordinated consultation to decide um, to really counsel the parents about the risks of prematurity that are associated with this and that you do have to balance the risk of having a very preterm delivery. Um, and we do this a lot for less heroic procedures than a, in utero myeloma and meningocele repair. Uh, our OBs do a whole host of fetal procedures. And anytime I have the opportunity to have fetal solve this way in a talk, I take it because it makes people giggle. But um, a lot of the work as we do is if we're doing this procedure and it goes south, what are we going to do? Knowing what we know about this baby now, if you go into labor at 25 weeks in the middle of your thoracoamniotic shunt, is your baby a candidate for resuscitation or not? Should you get steroids before the procedure? That sort of thing. Um, also, when women have had these procedures, particularly when the baby's going to be born with a thing like a chest tube or something else coming out, we do some guidance around what happens after delivery after you've had one of these procedures. So this stuff is, is rapidly evolving. We're figuring out how to do it. I think we've, we've come to a nice balance of how to do this. But, um, and some of these procedures are not that planned. Sometimes this is all going down in 12 to 24 hours that we have to sort all this out. Twins are a whole complicated and multifactorial issues. And one of the things that Marcy Treadwell says all the, all the time is twins is not a diagnosis. And what that means is that there are a lot of different kinds of twins and a lot of different kinds of twin complications. And it gets very difficult to sort out sometimes balancing the interest of one baby from another. All the OBs just walked in right on cue. That's awesome. All of them just walked in right on cue. Um, so, uh, so balancing fetal intervention to help one, but the other delivery to help one that might harm another baby that might stay better, do better to stay in. You could do a whole talk about that, but um, this is a really tough and complicated issue that that we are more and more involved in as uh, 
childbearing age is getting later and women are having more twins and multiples for a number of reasons. So we deal with this a lot. So what Bill Mendo taught me was that you can't talk about ethics without talking about epidemiology. Good ethics start with good facts. And we've really done some work at our own center to talk about, the, to talk about our outcomes here. One of the things we've done is just look at how good are we predicting these outcomes? Do we call it right? If we say the baby is going to live, does the baby live? And the good news is most of the time that's true. So we are, I would say, pretty good at calling the outcome. We are terrible at documenting what outcome we called, which makes doing the research pretty hard. But what we found is that when we think the outcome is good, the outcome is usually good. And when we think the outcome is bad, the outcome is pretty variable. It's sort of hard to predict who's really going to do badly and who might do a little better than expected. We've also looked at the role of palliative care consultation, prenatal palliative care consultation. Pain, perinatal hospice is its whole thing where you're not formally a perinatal hospice program, but we have a lot of the elements. Um, not surprisingly at our center, the worst prognosis, people with the worst prognosis are more likely to get a palliative care consultation. And they're more likely to be born with a comfort care plan after they're born. That should surprise no one. But they're not more likely to die during their in initial hospitalization, actually. So fear that referral to palliative care as a death sentence seems to be misplaced. And I think that's really reassuring. The other interesting thing that I think could serve any number of viewpoints is that although there's no absolute difference in the frequency of inpatient death, babies who didn't have a palliative care or consultation lived longer in the hospital before they died. And I think that that allows for the self-selection that we're seeing. If what you value is as long of a trial of therapy as possible and that every day that you want it is good, you can have that without fear that what you're having is a survival really, really, really bad outcome. If you don't put a big value on that prolonged hospitalization and what you want is a peaceful death without an ICU stay, palliative care seems to support that in, in a nice way. And so this was, this is more hypothesis generating than anything, but it certainly, it, it's got some, some threads that I think are worth pulling at and exploring more. We've also looked at disease specific populations. I worked with a really nice fellow named Stephanie Linema who's since graduated and she said, I'm interested in these preemies who have something else. What are we gonna do about preemies who also have something else? We're plagued by this at this institution. And so she did a nice cohort study looking at uh, preemies with congenital heart disease and what happens to preemies who have congenital heart disease and how do you call which ones are gonna do well and which ones aren't. And not surprisingly, the smaller ones and the ones with other stuff going on were less likely to survive the, their NICU stay, but most of the babies who died, died before they got a surgery. And most of the babies who made it to surgery survived and went home. And I think what's really important about that is that, again, it supports a trial of therapy. If you want to give it a go and see if you can get your preemie to heart surgery, you're either going to make it or you're not. And the, what we all fear, which is a months long hospitalization that ends in death after a lot of procedures, isn't the likely outcome for these kids. We have also looked at this in um, infants with um, severe anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract, and because some of them have very poor prognosis as well. Some of them are born with this brand of lethal pulmonary hypoplasia, and parents are really variable in terms of what they want for these kids. Um, some of my co-authors just walked in on this study, but we looked at, um, at our own center, uh, prenatal diagnoses of this, and looked at the outcomes. And again, what we find is about a third kid survived to a year of age, um, which is how far out we carried it, and then, of those who died, most of them died really early in the hospital course. And so again, if what you're worried about is a long hospitalization that ends badly, that's not the most likely outcome. On the other hand, if you're worried about a non-survivor, there are lots of non-survivors. And if what you're drawn to is comfort care rather than initiation of intensive care, we think we have support for doing that too. So I'm gonna close with two kind of personal stories about a really hot topic at this institution and everywhere. Um, this is a screen grab from a blog um, called Oscar's Odyssey and Stella's Story. The reason that's named that way is because initially this was thought to be a girl named Stella. And over the course of the um, prenatal care, it was found to be a boy with trisomy 13 named Albert. Um, and his parents lived in Ohio and I think at great insult to their egos, they came to the University of Michigan. I mean, she blogged about the pain of walking through the doors at the University of Michigan and like, I can't believe I'm here in Wolverine territory. But I looked at her blog after she had come to see us and we did this she was only gonna be able to come for one visit. So we got everybody in a room together, which is hard to do. Um, and, sh and the reason I'm telling this story is because we became part of that story for them and this blog and this experience the minute they walked through the door. Um, and it's not about me, but I was there and she remembers in a sense. And so this is what she wrote about it, which I, would made me feel really good about what we're doing here. She said, we then sat down with an entire team of five very notable, five very notable doctors from U of M, a cardiologist, a surgeon, 
They reviewed everything with us from our visit and really took the time to get to know us as well as our desires for Oscar. So these folks decided to deliver in Ohio actually for complicated reasons, but it's clearly not that we did a bad job. And this was a big test of concept for us. Can we do this for people? And can people who come in wanting everything get frank and balanced advice and leave feeling like we took good care of their family? And I think that they did. She's written to me since. Um, he was born in another hospital, had a prolonged hospitalization, and he did die during that hospitalization. She was really happy to share these pictures with me. And unlike my other family, she said, please use my pictures and please say his name. I don't want you to anonymize him. I want you to talk about him. And so, again, when you're thinking about what's a success and what's a failure, when you read her blog now, she's really coping with ongoing grief about the loss of her son, but not every moment of this was failure. I'm going to tell one more story about something like that, and then I'll close for, for some questions, even though I went a little longer than I promised. There's been obsessive interest in trisomy 13 out in the community, and I want to tell one story about, uh, about a family that came to see us a few years ago. Um, I first saw a little note in the, in the sort of triage thing for my clinic appointment that said, we are calling to find out what you can offer for trisomy 18. And my reaction at the time was like, oh, no, I, you know, like we're going to do this trisomy 18 thing. And I meet this very lovely family, and she says, I got counseled by MFM in the northern part of the state, and what they told me was that they would be happy to wrap my baby in a blanket and let me hold him. Um, and no one would even talk to me about anything else, and no one would even talk to me about any other option. This is going to be my fifth C-section, and I'm worried that it's going to take a long time and that my baby will die before I even am done with my C-section. And can you at least meet my kid? I understand that this is bad. There are limits to what I would want, but can you at least meet my kid? And so we met her kid. Uh, she delivered here in a scheduled C-section, um, delivered Eli. Again, she's one who shared these pictures and re actually requested that I use his name and tell her story. And please stop asking me. Yes, you can use the pictures. And she, um, uh, he needed a little help with CPAP when he was born. Um, his mom was really nervous. The, the, the whole work around the delivery was, will he live long enough for me to meet him? And we were able to stabilize him, and then we were able to stabilize him some more. And then he was looking really good, except for this persnickety, I think, aortic coarctation that he had that was going to need attention before he left. And the whole team came together and agonized about whether or not he should have the surgery, whether or not we would offer the surgery. We ended up offering it. And I was really worried that he was going to get the surgery and not be able to extubate after the surgery. He hadn't been intubated until that point. And I said, we're going to do this, and he's going to die exactly how you didn't want him to. And she said, I hear you and I understand that. I just, I have faith that it's not going to go that way. I, I have to try this if it's being offered to me. And then she sent me this picture of his ventilator after he'd been successfully extubated after his surgery. And like, I just got an email with this picture. Um, and so we did. So we extubated and he went home. And he also died at home within a few months. But this is a picture of him and his family at the, at the town high school football game. And this was the goal at the front end. It wasn't live forever. It wasn't trach. It wasn't everything ever because of the the advocacy groups it's i want my baby to come home and be part of my family and we were able to do that for them and there's a plurality of what people want around trisomy 13 and 18 but these experiences have been really impactful to me in thinking about how to take on these families and how to strike a balance between not doing things that we think aren't in a baby's best interest but giving them the opportunities they want to have their baby be part of the family the way they, they want um so here's a kind of wrap-up slide about what we've talked about today and some pragmatic stuff in there too Whenever I do a consult, I think, what is it that they're asking me for? And if I don't know, I ask more questions until I know. Walking in without knowing what the point of your being there, it, being there is, is always a problem. Um, do I have all the information I need to do it? Sometimes we reschedule. You know, sometimes I get scheduled before the ultrasound, and I say, I got to have the ultrasound before I do this consult. Do I need to phone a friend? Do I have all the people that I need? Do I have all the resources that I need? Do I need to talk to palliative care? Do I need to talk to cardiology? Do I need to circle back with OB yet again? What, what do I need to do this well? And then how do I do it? So Sarah Gullerter has term, coined the term, I had a two box of Kleenex conversation with the family. Um, so one thing, you need the Kleenex, which is sometimes a problem, but two, just thinking about, is this a sad talk or not? Do I know how to do it? And how do I know if I've done it well? Even folks who are really experienced sometimes come out of a consult and go, oh, that just didn't go the way I wanted it to go. But I think we could do better at least in setting ourselves up to do well. And then some more sort of general things. One of the hardest things, I think, to build in a group when you're doing this is this service model. How can I help you? Both to the people who are asking you to see the patient and to the family. And I always start, what is it that you're hoping to get out of this? How can I help you? Um, you need some kind of script. 
we really don't like to do consults blind. We like to know what we're going into and have kind of a plan. I have a way I talk about prematurity, but you also need to see when it's not working and you have to deviate and do something else. Um, reasonable people disagree about what is right and what is good. And we have to embrace that plurality or we're gonna be miserable people. I think that accepting that I'm gonna see patients who want something for their baby that I would never want for my own has been a big part of my enjoying this work. And, and again, it's hard to teach and it's hard to maintain, but it's really important. Um, and finally, we are not gonna be able to predict everything that happens. Terrible situations usually end, but we don't always know when and how, and accepting that we can't predict the future is tough, but important. So we've been really lucky here um, to kind of build an exciting group of people who work on a lot of stuff together. This is actually not exhaustive. This is sort of, I ran out of the bandwidth to put more on the slide. But we've had a lot of projects with a lot of cool collaborators. Stephanie Kokora came up as my fellow and one of our junior faculty, and she frankly doesn't need me anymore, so I gave her her own box. Um, we share a lot of work together, and that's been really fun. If this jokes your interest and you want to get involved with some of the work that we're doing, please talk to me. We've always got more stuff. We've always got room for more people. So who doesn't love a baby in sunglasses? Uh, I will take questions if you have them. And I have a mic. If you want to um, um, in the broad uh, scope, certainly it does in terms of what people think about and ask about. Um, in terms of actually doing the surgeries, it sometimes comes up for very specific and poignant reasons of insurance won't pay for it. Um, that has happened with some of the fetal surgeries, for example. Um, usually, if the baby has been stabilized in the NICU and the procedure has been offered, I've never had an insurance company refuse to pay for it in that sense. In the broader scope of whether the cost of care of infants who will ultimately die should be considered in the care that we do, I mean, certainly on the ethics committee, what we say is we're not in the business of rationing at the bedside. And unless we have coherent institutional and political, so not political, but sort of at any numbers of the institutional level, unless we have coherent policies around it, generally at University of Michigan, our sense is if there's a good medical rationale for offering it, we'll offer it. Um, whether that's always gonna be true, I think is up in the air, but certainly on a case by case basis, but this will be expensive is something that we actually try not to, to address for a whole host of reasons. I think that there are two components of that. Uh, one is that we are probably getting better at it. Um, certainly we are getting better at it here for a host of reasons that I'm, I'm looking at the smiling folks who make us better at it. Um, I think that the other is that we look at it more carefully. So when we didn't offer the resuscitation of 23 weekers, live born 23 weekers all died. And so some of it is that we're better at it. Over time, if you look at long-term outcomes over time, they're getting a little better, but not a lot better. That's a good question. So the issue with the calculator is it's a fixed data set. It's not continually updated. It's 10 years old. People have observed that the calculator is going to kind of age out. The calculator has been validated in other populations, but could the outputs change with a newer data set? Yeah. Ah, OK. <laughs> All right. Discharge until unless I get a better offer. Yeah, I'm back. Kids are hot. That's a really good question, and I think you could answer it in a number of ways. One is there's some technical considerations, right? Certain genetic disorders more likely in IVF, for example. Um, more in my wheelhouse, I'd say, is what you're pointing out is how high the stakes are. 
And I think one of the things certainly that we see is that women, so I was thinking about this actually, I was repairing and I didn't want to call something a last ditch pregnancy because that doesn't sound right. But we do see a lot of women who say, I know that this is my last chance to have a baby. And now I'm ruptured at 22 weeks. And I think that the stakes of that and acknowledging that and sussing that out at the front end is really important. So certainly one of the ways that I cope with that with all of the patients I see is I start by saying, tell me your story. And sometimes the story starts, well, today the fluid is a little more than yesterday. And sometimes the story is we've been trying for 10 years to have a baby. And, and where people start that story, I think can give you some clues into what, what's really at stake with this pregnancy. Um, and certainly the higher likelihood of multiples to a higher chance of preterm labor, all of that plays into who we see and who we take care of. So I think the whole area is really important. Andy. My Um, that's a great question that I, I wish I was a little more prepared for. But um, one thing I'd say is about not offering choices if you're not authentically interested in doing all of them. So one of the things that I think I see more outside of the NICU is the kind of bluff of you could have this thing that we really don't recommend. Wouldn't you like to see the nice palliative care docs instead? And when people say, no, I want the thing, then they say, I don't really want to do the thing. And so I think that don't put anything on the table that you're not prepared to offer would be one. And the other would be the kind of empathy, bad news, bad. People aren't defective for wanting their loved ones to live. And I took it out of the slide because someone gave me a good criticism about having it in, but I used to have this thing in my slide about um, don't ask people to root against their own kids. And, and the criticism I got was a lot of people choose comfort care who aren't rooting against their own kids, which is actually absolutely true. But what I would say is rational people want stuff that we wish they didn't want. And I do think actually we're probably nicer about that when it comes to babies and high stakes pregnancies than we are about older kids or sicker adults and, and things like that. So I think those are, the, those are the two that come to mind. But now I have to think about that some more because it's a good question. I would take one more if there was one more. Dan. So, thank you. Um, right, so I think about patients, I think in terms of they're getting their healing from the perspective of only the physician, um, whether it be an oncologist or absolutely. Has there ever been any thought, or maybe it already happens, and I don't know how you could actually mobilize it, but people with different perspectives, different disciplines, or even Parents of survivors of NICU uh, grads, per se, or those who didn't make it out of the NICU being a part of that prenatal counseling? It's a great question. And I think the answer is yes, there are a lot of ways that folks are approaching that. Um, the most compelling, I think, has been the move to including people call them different things. We call ours parent hosts, some people call them veteran parents. Um, there's just a nice paper published about the role of those folks. We are looking to figure out how to include them in our prenatal counseling. Again, I would caution against there's no single parent and there's no single story. But um, our parents host do our NICU tours. So when our parents, where our women are well enough to go up to the unit and have a tour, that's done by our parent hosts. And our parents hosts have asked us to let them know when these women are here and they do want to see them. Um, that's the biggest way I'd say. There's also, of course, a role for social workers and any number of other professions. Um, here, some programs employ use of nurses much more for the, the face time with the family. Um, there are places that are better than we are about offering follow-up phone conversations with women and seeing if they need to come back in. We're working on a model where could nurse practitioners be involved in some of our consults and actually doing some of our consults and things like that. So yeah, I think that's ripe for exploration and more work. Um, a lot of it costs money, but yeah, it's a, it's a great question. All right. I'm happy to hang around if folks have more questions, but in respect for your time, I'm going to cut you loose.